Hi everyone, this is Jackie from Project Piaba. So we're going to do a slightly different kind of video today. We thought that since a lot of people are sort of trapped inside and looking for activities to do with their kids or their students or even just with your roommates or people that you live with, um, that instead of just telling you about cool Amazonian fish that are sustainably produced and that help provide a beneficial source of income to people in the Amazon, we'd show you a cool activity you can do at home. So this thing that I'm holding right here is called the Secchi Disk, and this is a thing that scientists use to measure water clarity, and that can be affected by a whole lot of things. So throughout this video, I'll tell you when is a good time to take a dramatic pause and have a conversation with um, the people who you're doing this activity with as to like what kinds of things you think will happen in the experiment that I'll show you at home. But first, a show and tell about the Secchi Disk. So first off, it's a bright sunny day here, and this is Boston Harbor. Um, so it's important that it's a bright sunny day because what I'm going to show you requires light penetration into the water. So you couldn't do this activity at night unless you had a really bright flashlight and then that would skew your results. And you also wouldn't want to do this activity on a cloudy day because that'll give you different results than if you do it on a bright sunny day, even though nothing has changed within the water column. So what this device measures, as I stated earlier, is water quality. And you can see it's got a dark side and a light side. Sometimes they make them with cool different colors so you can tell actual color penetration into the water column and that's really cool too but this one is just black and white and I'm going to show you how to make one at home that you can use in either your aquarium or in a bucket of special water that I'll show you how to make too. So the way that this works is it has a line on it that's measured out to certain lengths and that tells you how deep into the water the Secchi disc actually goes. And so that tells you how far you can see into the water. So the clarity of the water is actually twice the distance of what you're seeing. So as I lower this out into the harbor, it's got a weight on the bottom of it, so it actually sinks. And so what we do is we drop it down to the point where we can't see it anymore. See how it's getting harder and harder to see? I can still see it. The camera might see differently than I do, but I can still see the white part of it. I can still see it and Guess what? I can't see it anymore. So now I'm going to pull it up just a little bit more. Oh, I can see it. I can't see it. So that looks like it's exactly the spot. So right here, that tells you that you can see whoop, this far into Boston Harbor today. So. There, there is actually um, measurements marked out on this line to tell you exactly how far that is. If we were doing this incredibly scientifically, I would know how far those measurements are. I'm guessing that they're a meter. So you can see approximately two and a half meters down into Boston Harbor today. That means that the clarity of the water is actually twice that because the light that you're seeing reflected back to you from the Secchi disk is actually going down and then back up to your eyes. And I'm cheating a little bit. I've got my polarized lenses on. So you would get a different result if you were doing this exact same experiment and you didn't have these fun um, fish seeing eyeglasses on. Um, so about two and a half meters. So that's actually, what's twice that? Somebody help me with the math at home. Dramatic pause, five meters. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's how this device is um, supposed to work. So in a few moments, I will show you how to make one at home. Okay, I'm back. And this time I'm actually in my apartment as opposed to Boston Harbor. So I apologize for any of the hooting sounds that you may hear my roommate is a pigeon. Um, so here is the Secchi disc that I showed you in Boston Harbor, where we got about five meters of uh, visibility down into the water column. Uh, so that's, uh, I just wanted to show you this, uh, this particular Secchi disc is made out of plywood um, and it has a weight on the bottom, I think this is zinc, I think this is the kind of zinc that you put like on a boat or a dock or something like that. Um, but anyway, the idea is weight. Um, so the cool thing for this experiment that I'm going to show you guys is um, you can make a Secchi disc out of just about any kind of household material that you have laying around, even in quarantine without a trip to the store. Um, you can find the materials to make this. So I'm going to show you this one that I made, and I have used this a lot at trade shows, fish conventions, um, things like that, anywhere where I'm doing like an activity booth and I want to show um, people how Secchi discs work and how to um, compare water clarity within different systems because the Rio Negro, where a lot of the fish that uh, Project Piaba is interested in come from, um, is a really interesting habitat for this kind of experiment. 
So I'm going to show you this one up close. So this one um, is actually a coffee cup lid, a disposable coffee cup lid. Um, so it's a plastic lid and I just drew on it with Sharpie. This took me about 12 seconds to make um, at a fish convention and it has a little binder clip on the bottom to weight it down and it has a long piece of string. I actually at one point had um, had inch, inches marked off in here um, on the string. You can actually still see some of the markings, but this uh, has been used so much in um, a bucket of like tea water that uh, the string is no longer white. Uh, it used to be white. It's not white anymore. Um, so that's cool. So you can make your own secchi disc. It doesn't have to be a disposable coffee lid. It can be like a little piece of plastic. It can be the lid off of the sour cream container that you're done with or cottage cheese or whatever. Um, the only important part is that it has um, a black and a white markings on it so that you can actually see um, the contrast when you lower the thing down into the water. So that's the important part. And here is a fun Google Earth tour of um, some of the area where the fishery occurs in the Rio Negro. So here we are in Boston Harbor. Uh, this is where I took the Secchi Disc video. And then um, we'll just scroll out quite a bit here um, and make our way down to South America. And so here is the Amazon River that runs from west to east across South America. And then here is the Rio Negro, which is the largest tributary of the Amazon River, which runs kind of northwest to southeast um, and dumps into the Amazon. Uh, so you can see on the satellite imagery here, there is a huge difference between the Rio Negro or the Black River, um, what it looks like on satellite photos versus the Rio Negro, which is more of a muddy, or I'm sorry, versus the Amazon, which is a more muddy brown. So you have the black water of the Rio Negro and the muddy brown water of the Amazon. And this has huge implications for the fish that live in this habitat. So in order to talk a little bit more about this, I've actually just um, microwaved some water. science and I've got a tea bag so a lot of people are familiar with tea um, you've made tea you've drank tea um, or you know someone who has um, so here is my tea bag and when you put a tea bag in hot water the tea comes out of the water and that is actually very similar to what is happening in the Rio Negro except it's not it's not tea it's not exactly tea um, but it is like the leaves and the soil and stuff in the watershed and in the rainforest. So um, in the rainforest, you have, in addition to the soil, um, you have things like um, things like plants, you know, the things that come off of trees. You know, you've got pine cones, not exactly pine cones, but um, these ones are alder cones. You've got like little pods and stuff, seed pods and things. You've got like the stems that come off of bananas. You've got like leaves and things like that. And these are things that aquarists, people who keep blackwater aquariums, um, use to actually color the water of their aquarium. So this one I actually uh, will also use peat moss in here um, and that actually gives it like that those tannins, those that dark water like the Rio Negro has. So just like when you make tea and the good dark stuff comes out of the tea bag and goes into the water, the same thing is happening in the Rio Negro, right? So it's a river that has not a whole lot of um, elevation change between from source to sink. So there's a very gradual gradient, right? So not a whole lot of elevation change and the water is kind of percolating and steeping through the watershed on its way down, right? So it's going through the flooded forest, it's taking all of that that um, humic acid, those, that tannic acid, all of that stuff out of the soil and out of the leaves and out of all of that stuff in the watershed, and it's making that um, into, um, into the water. So that has implications for the fish in terms of all kinds of things to do with water chemistry, right? So not just the activity that we're going to do here, um, but also like pH and things like that. Very, very important for the fish. Um, so I'm gonna take my Secchi disc, which I made, and I am going to show you the five gallons of tea that I made earlier. So this is just regular tea. This is not black water like what you would put in your aquarium. This is actual legitimate tea. And I highly recommend doing this part of the experiment in your bathtub or um, at least not on mom's white carpet. Um, <laughs> someplace that you can get wet and covered in tea. So um, five gallons of tea. It takes about 10 tea bags in order to make this um, darkness of water. So 
what I would like to do is the same kind of secchi disc activity like we did in Boston Harbor. You just kind of have to poke it to get it to sink a little bit. And then you lower it down till you can't see it anymore. Oh, it looks like about there. Okay. And then you pull it up and you see that that is how far you were able to see into the water column. So I've got my little measuring device out right here. And you can see that that is approximately 10 inches that you can see into the water column in our bucket of tea water. Now again, don't put that in your aquarium because it's tea. It's different than black water. It's not very different. It's the same idea, um, but it has all kinds of things in it that are probably bad for fish, like caffeine. You don't want your fish to be caffeinated, right? Ooh, crazy, crazy fish. Um, so anyway, the other thing that I want to show you, the second part of this experiment that's really fun, um, involves a tank. Okay, so you don't necessarily need to have exactly this kind of tank. You can have um, any kind of container that will hold water. Again, I'm social distancing, so I'm trying to film this um, video selfie style. So bear with me as I move my tripod around here. Um, but any kind of container that will hold water. If you have a two and a half gallon aquarium, great, right? It's perfect. It's a cute little aquarium. You can add water to it and do these kinds of experiments. Um, if you don't, I also have this giant cheese ball container, um, <laughs> which actually contains water from Boston Harbor. So when I showed you the secchi disc activity um, yesterday, I actually also took a cheese balls container with a water home. Um, and so I will be able to show you that. So you could use any kind of thing like this. You could, if mom has a big flower vase like this, or even a big mason jar or a coffee pot, um, something like that, a big, um, you know, measuring cup any kind of clear container you can use for this. And you're also going to need a picture of a fish um, or like a postcard or something like that. You can print one off online or actually, I think it's actually way more fun to make your own. So here's one that I made. This is a Cardinal Petra that I drew. Um, it's a little bit wet because my table was wet when I set it down. So be careful about that. Um, so it's actually really simple to make these. They're just, you know, it's blue, it's red, it's a fish. Um, and that could be really fun. And actually, this would be a really fun experiment if you wanted to make lots of different kinds of fish and then repeat the experiment with your different fish. This would be so great for like a science fair, like poster project um, to make different kinds of fish and then see how this experiment looks with those different types of fish. Oh, that would be so fun. <laughs> if you do that, please um, send me a video or photos or something because I would love to see your fish. Um, so anyway, then you take your fish and you put them um, behind your tank, like so. And again, if you're using um, mom's flower vase or your cheese ball container, you would probably need like a little piece of tape or something to attach them there. And actually, I might also need a piece of tape. Now you've attached your fish to the back of your tank, like so, and now um, you can go ahead and add some water and see how this works. So what do we think is going to happen as we add the tea water to this tank? Feel free to pause the video and talk about it, or just watch. So as we add the water, You've got these bright, colorful fish. They're red, they're blue, they're very vibrant, they're very beautiful. You can see them from 10 miles away because the colors are so bright. Until you put them in this tea water. And again, this water is actually not quite as dark as some of the water in some of the places in the Rio Negro. I have been places in the Rio Negro where I'm standing in knee deep water and I can't see my feet. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, check it out. What has happened to those fish? They're still there, I promise. You just can't see them anymore, right? So how did you have this very bright blue and red fish go from being highly visible to almost unable to be seen completely, right? That is um, what this colored water does to the fish in this habitat. So that has very important implications for um, the fish in this habitat when you think about um, things like, um, well, let's talk about it in a minute because I want to show you what do you think would happen if you had um, fish like this in Boston Harbor? If you had cardinal tetras, you know, fish that are bright red, bright blue, 
um, or just very vibrantly colored in water like Boston Harbor? Let's find out. So I'm going to take my, my cheese ball container worth of Boston Harbor water and I'm going to pour it in there. All right, how many of you thought that we were going to be able to see these fish a whole lot better in the Boston Harbor water? I did, right? So um, this actually has a lot of importance for the fish that live in these habitats, right? If you had a cardinal tetra that lived in Boston Harbor, um, it would most likely be dead, right? Other than the fact that it's a tropical fish and it probably couldn't survive very long in cold, salty water. Um, but also, it's bright red, it's bright blue, it would be bird food or fish food or, um, you know, eaten by some other type of visual predator, right? So this has a lot of meaning for the fish that live there, right? So you can be this colored fish in the Rio Negro and it doesn't necessarily impact your survivability as a species, right? But if you are this colored fish in Boston Harbor, right, every single visual predator can see you and will probably eat you pretty quickly. Um, so that's important. That's something to think about, right? And I would love to see if you repeat this experiment with different um, darknesses of tea water and different, um, different colored fish, um, just to see how the different colors work. Um, if there's any co particular color that you can see better, I don't know. I haven't done that experiment. It would be so fun to do though, wouldn't it? Um, so anyway, that's pretty cool. And this has a lot of meaning for the animals that live there. So actually, when I took my cheese balls container worth of water from Boston Harbor, um, I didn't realize it, but I had accidentally gotten a bunch of jellyfish at um, that time of the year in Boston Harbor, and um, and I had actually scooped some jellyfish up too. Um, so if you stay tuned through the entire video, I will show you those guys at the end because they're cool, but they have absolutely nothing to do with Project Piaba. Um, although something that's important to think about in terms of um, this experiment and in terms of how far you can see into the water um, is what are some things that impact that. So we know that we talked about tannins already. We talked about the stuff that's dissolved out of the soil that goes into the water like, you know, like tea. So here's my tea after the couple minutes that I've been talking, right? So um, this actually hasn't been in my fish bucket, so I feel pretty safe about drinking it. Um, but so you've got um, things that are dissolved in the water like tannins. Um, the stuff that comes out of the soil and out of the driftwood and out of the forest, right? You've got those types of sources. Um, but some other things, what are some other things that can impact um, how far you can see into the water column? Um, I've made a list, and I hope that you guys have to at some dramatic pause point in this video. Um, turbidity is a big one, right? So you've got, if you've ever been to a lake or a pond um, or a river or something like that, and you've like walked into the water and, and kind of dug your feet around in the sand, right? Kicked up the dirt. That's turbidity. And that can happen like on a small scale, like when you're kicking up the dirt, or on a big scale, like if you have a dredge or something, like some sort of project like that, that's really mixing up the sediment into the water column. That impacts how well visual predators can see. And it also impacts, like you're actually putting like literal dirt in the water, right? So it actually impacts the way that a lot of those animals with gills can breathe, right? If you've got a fish and it's got like mucus on its gills and then all of a sudden you've got dirt floating around in the water that can stick to their mucus and make it hard for them to breathe, right? So that's another important factor in terms of fish health and ecology. Um, also runoff and rain. There's a whole lot of seasonal changes that can happen in ecosystems, right? The Rio Negro is a huge one, right? It's hugely impacted by water level changes seasonally, right? But also, even just in Boston Harbor, if you get like a very big rainstorm or a very big, um, you know, event, a big storm, a big nor'easter that kind of blows up the wind and kicks up all the junk, right? You're gonna end up with, with um, more turbid water from an event like that. Also, all of the dirt washing off of the parking lots, right, in the springtime. After all the snow melts, you get all of that dirt that just kind of washes down, right? So that's going to impact how far you can see into the water. Also, pollution is a big one, right? So not just pollution like um, like oil and gas and you know trash and things like that, but also pollution like the nutrients that run out of the fertilizer that people put on their lawns, right, can have a huge impact on um, on how far you can see into the water, water clarity and turbidity and stuff like that. Um, because also a lot of that stuff is feeding um, 
feeding plankton. So plankton is a really big one. So I showed you earlier, I got some of these accidental jellyfish in my water sample from Boston Harbor, right? So um, it would take an awful lot of jellyfish to impact how much, um, how, how much light penetration you get into your water, but it actually does not take a lot of plankton um, because these jellyfish are here seasonally, they're actually eating up the plankton. And the plankton is very important because it is um, causing a huge difference in how much light penetration you're getting into the aquatic environment. So um, if you go out into Boston Harbor or out onto Stellwagen Bank or someplace like that, the water looks kind of greenish, right? Um, it's not green because that's the color of the water. It's green because that's the color of the plankton that's living in the water, right? So that's what these jellyfish are eating. That's what um, that's what whales are eating. That's what all kinds of things, all kinds of animals that live in that aquatic environment are eating off of that primary productivity, right? Um, so that's important, and that can affect your water clarity. Um, also, filter feeders, right? All of those things that you have in the ecosystem that are eating that primary productivity are going to also impact your water clarity, right? And you can see these things with um, SecuDisc data. So if you're interested in this, there are a number of sites online where you can um, <clears throat> where you can go and check out um, data, right? You can like hunt down data in a particular site. And there's also a lot of opportunities for citizen science where you can get involved in a project like this when it's safe to do so. Um, and you can um, participate in taking data like this. And that, that can be really cool to compare your local habitat where you can go and take a SecuDisc reading to, um, you know, someplace exotic like the Rio Negro or someplace like that. Um, so that can be really fun. And actually, I found some superlative data online when I was like doing a little bit of research about SecuDiscs and I was looking for sites that have um, data for different places. And um, the furthest SecuDisc reading ever recorded was 80 meters. Um, so the, the scientists that were doing this could see 80 meters down. Um, and this was recorded in the Weddell Sea in Antarctica. So um, pretty cool, very, very clear water. Um, and so lots of things are, are impacted by that. And um, so it's really cool to think, about, um, to think about how our actions have an impact on the environment, right? So like that's one that you wouldn't necessarily think of is like your, you know, the stuff that you put on your lawn, even if you live far from the ocean, um, all of that stuff can rinse down and end up in your watershed, which can then rinse down and, um, and impact aquatic environments. So really cool stuff to think about. Um, and so that is pretty much what I wanted to show you today. Oh, actually, um, here is, um, this is not actually uh, milk or eggnog from Winster Farms. Um, this is actually black water extract that I made for my aquarium. So um, the coolest part about fish keeping is trying to um, constantly trying to um, recreate natural environments for fish and to like bring them into your home and to be connected to that wild environment. So um, one of my favorite things about Project Piaba is how well it does this, um, how well it connects you to the environment where your fish come from and the people who are doing the fishing for those fish. Um, so that's that's a really exciting thing. So I actually um, make black water for my tank um, to help um, make it a more natural environment for the fish. And I do um, things like peat moss and these banana stems and these almond leaves and all those kinds of things like that. Um, not tea bags, um, but actual things that, that in the actual ecosystem are actually doing that um, tannin creation and that, that water darkening effect for the fish. And the fish actually respond very, very well to it. Um, so I did want to show you that. And as I promised, um, you've made it to the end of this video. So I'm going to show you the jellyfish really up close and personal. Um, but while I do, uh, please connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or on our website, www.projectpiaba.org. Um, connect with us. I'd love to see photos, videos, um, posters if you guys decide to do this project at home. Um, I think it's really fun and I think it's a good um, opportunity and, and it's really great. So um, these jellyfish are Sarcia tubulosa. They're actually a hydromedusa um, and scientists study them pretty closely because they are lightning fast at carbon intake. Um, so they can assimilate a molecule of carbon into their tissues with like lightning speed. So look that up online. They're really fascinating. Again, Sarcia tubulosa, um, hydromedusa, one of my favorite Boston Harbor residents. Actually, probably my favorite Boston Harbor aquatic life. <laughs>
pretty cool. And I didn't even realize, like, I just scooped a cheese ball's worth of container, or cheese ball container worth of water, and um, tis the season when there are a lot of those. And um, I thought that I had one, and I scooped it out until I went to do this experiment earlier, and I was like, oh gosh, there's like actually 10 of them in there. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so now I guess I have some jellyfish that I have to return to Boston Harbor tomorrow. Um, cool. Thanks for watching. Again, I'm Jackie, Project Piaba, and connect with us. We'd love to hear from you.